uh, in that. But, but at the end of the day, we just go, thank you, Jesus, for the gift of life. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of life. It is God's plan for all of us. And it's how God's purpose gets worked out in all of us. From life to eternal life. You know, it's funny that human life and our life is, is how God brings salvation. God sent his son, Jesus, in a human life to bring salvation to everyone who lives a human life who puts their faith in him. It is through this gift of life that God introduces us to his promise of eternal life, which is his purpose for every human being. And so it's, for instance, uh, why we're so dedicated to being an advocate and, thr and seeing the thriving of human beings and the, and the ability of people to see what is at stake here. You know, friends, we're actually involved in a cosmic war between life and death. And so today, as we say we're standing on the side of life, there is resistance to that. And there is uncomfortability in that. And it is not the simplest of, the, well, we're just naive and we think this. Look, there's a lot of complexity, and we'll walk through some of that uh, today. But uh, first, we want to read the scripture together. And I promise you that we are going to start at the very beginning. We're going to start on page one. Actually, on my Bible, it's page two, because we're going to start in Genesis chapter one uh, in verse third, or 25. So if you would stand with me, we'll, I'd like to read out loud and together. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, actually verses 26 through 31. It is the account of God's creation of human beings. So we're going to read this miraculous and amazing account that brings such insight and, and wisdom to all of us about why are we here and what is God's plan. So let's read out loud and together from the Word of God, starting in verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Would you pray with me? Father, we are submitting our minds and our hearts to the truth of your word today. Lord, in particular, on this day where we acknowledge the sanctity of human life in that human life comes from and belongs to you, Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand what is special about the human creation, what is unique, and what your purpose and your intent is. God, I pray that everyone here today would not only acknowledge the uniqueness of the human being, but, Father, would acknowledge and accept your purpose for all of us, which is to know your son, Jesus Christ, and to receive not only life here and now, but walk into eternal life through the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation of our souls. So Lord, let your word be planted in us today and let it bear great fruit for you and for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Friends, you can have a seat. So there's a lot of directions that we could go here in Genesis chapter 1, even in these few short verses. By the way, this is the sixth and final day of creation in the account of Genesis. God has, has walked through the creation of everything that exists. Hey, bud. Oh, he's getting a Kleenex. I got you. He said, I just didn't want my dad to be the only one who got attention in church. So uh, no, this is my buddy Noah here. So say hi to Noah, everyone. I like Noah. He's my friend. 
uh, God created everything that exists. By his word, God spoke and the universe came into existence. God spoke and light itself was given birth to. God separated the, the oceans from the dry land. God brought forth vegetation uh, on the dry land. God brought animals, and, and the Bible says, all the creeping things that creep on the face of the earth. Like, really, God, did you have to make creepy stuff? I'm just saying, like, does anybody else have a problem with those stink bugs at your house, too? Yeah, I thought it was just me, and I was getting a, a, a complex about it. I'm like, man, they must, I, do I stink or something? And I realized, no, it's you, too. You stink also, and so, and I like the way you stink, so let's stink, stink together. Anyway, I think those stink bugs are part of the creeping things that creep uh, that, that the Bible talks about, but God created everything, everything that exists, and at the end of God's creation of this world and everything that he has said about in it, God had one more thing in plan. He had one more creation in store to set there, and it is humans. It is man, and I use the word man as the, the phrase to encompass the human race. He created Adam, and out of Adam, Eve. And God, of all of the things that he created, humans have something distinct about them that is not spoken of or is, or is not true of anything else that God created. You see, everything that came about came about by the word and the will of God. Everything that exists, the Bible tells us that it was the word and the will of God that spoke it. God said, let there be light, and guess what happened? Light responded to the will and the word of God. And when it comes to human beings, indeed, we were created by the will and the word of God, but there is something deeper that God had in store and in mind and in plan for human beings. And we see a clue about this when it describes human beings, when the Lord says, let us make man, what? In our image and in our likeness. This is an early reference in the Bible to the fact that God, our God who is one, is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we see even just, and that's not really the point of this passage of scripture, but it's worth acknowledging, otherwise you have a hard time explaining who our is who our is. The New Testament sheds great light on who was engaged and involved in the act of creation. It tells us that nothing in all this world was created without Jesus being involved. It says specifically Jesus, God's son. So we see God the son being involved. The Genesis talks about the spirit of God hovering over the surface of the deep, of the waters. The spirit of God, the father, the son, the spirit, all involved together by the will and word of God for his glory. But with human beings, it is, they are the only part of creation that receives this distinction of being made according to a blueprint and a plan and a likeness that bears a resemblance to the creator himself. I mean, all of creation testifies to the glory of God. Everything that we see, the stars, the deepest universe telescope that you could get will all point to the glory of God. You could look to the earth, you could look below the sea. Everything that exists, it testifies to the glory of God, but only human beings bear a resemblance to their creator. You say, what does that mean? What does it mean to be made in the image or the likeness of God? Well, can I give you the short answer before I spend a long time explaining it? Here's the short answer. I don't really know. There's a lot of ways we could go with what does it mean, image or likeness. For instance, the Bible uses both of those words in different ways. Uh, one of the ways that the Bible uses the form image is in a negative connotation to refer to idols. Idols. Th those false Images, those false representations that were worshipped as gods, but were actually just representations of demonic lies. So there was a practice. I mean, we all know that there's a commandment that God has given, and he has imp imprinted it on our soul that God alone is to be worshipped. We are not to worship ourselves. We are not to worship any other created thing. We are not to worship our families or our career. We are not to worship animals or the stars or the moon or anything along those lines. We are to worship God and God alone. Are you aware of this as a commandment of God? Is this your ambition to live a life that worships God alone? So anything that, that is worship that is other than God is by definition idolatry. 
It is false worship, and, it, and the object of that false worship is placed in a position to be a false god. Now, it's interesting. We've got to be careful here because you might think, well, this is, a less, this is a part of the lesson where we judge ancient people or we judge different cultures because nobody here worships false gods. We don't have something on the shelf at home and this and that. Well, there are many cultures around the world and even in our own country because many cultures around the world are mixed together in our own country that have these practices. You say, is that what this is exclusively talking about? Well, that is certainly encompassed in what we are talking about. But this, con- this idea of worship God alone is much bigger than don't just carve an image. But it says in Isaiah chapter 40, and in this, this section in the book of Isaiah, there is much discussion between the prophet Isaiah and God about the practice of the people in the land of Israel and the, the land in which they inhabited uh, to worship false gods, to make an idol for themselves. And in fact, there's, there's, a, there's a number of places in the Bible where God employs sarcasm, sarcasm towards those who would make an idol and then bow down and worship or pray to that idol, something that they made with their own hands that now they expect that is going to be their salvation or is going to be their help. Like, you made that. Why are you asking the thing that you made for permission to do? Like, it doesn't make any sense. God's like, how's that working for you? You know, and, and it's an interesting thing. But uh, in Isaiah chapter 40, here's a, two questions back to back that ask about, in the context of idols that are set up, like people carve the image of a human or they carve the image of an animal. They say, this is our God now. We can hold it. We can control it. We, it's, we're safe. We can move it around. If we have to move, we can move. It can move with us. We can see it. We can feel it. It's our God. And, he, and, and this is a question that's asked in Isaiah 40, 18. To whom, then, will you liken God? To whom will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? And this is a fair question, because there are many people around the world who would have an answer to that question. They'd say, oh, it's the likeness of my ancestor. That's who I would liken God to. Oh, it's the likeness of a golden calf. That's what Moses' brother Aaron presented before the people. said, these are your gods. Worship them. The problem in each of these cases is that neither of them are your God. They're not the real God. They are both a a false likeness of something that God himself has created. God has created every human being. God has created every animal. And to mistake the created thing for the creator is idolatry. But when we come to this, you say, the likeness that we bear to God Uh, is unique in us. Another uh, way in which the same words, likeness and image, are used, it's again a negative application, and I hope we're going to see some positive out of this. First of all, from that Isaiah 40, there is no earthly likeness or comparison to God. That's what we see. There is no uh, earthly likeness or comparison to God. So what about humans? Aren't we created in his image? Let's get there in a minute. But let's, let's look here, because another way that we can understand this idea of What does it mean to be created in the likeness of God? If we understand the word likeness to also mean pattern or purpose, design, intention, then it sheds greater light. For instance, here's the same word used in 2 Kings chapter 16. It says, now King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria. Tiglath. How'd you like to be, be named Tiglath? You know, the wonderful thing about Tiglath is you would be the only one, because I don't know anybody else named Okay, that was a Winnie the Pooh joke for anybody who missed it there. That was like one Tigger? Okay, never mind. Whatever. So here we go. Uh, The king of Assyria. So the king of Ahaz, who's the king in Jerusalem, goes to Damascus to meet with the foreign king, and he saw the altar, which was at Damascus. Time out here for just a minute. The altar at Damascus was not an altar to God Most High. It was not an altar that God had prescribed that incense and offering should be offered on. It was an altar to foreign and false gods. It was an altar to demons. And so the king of the Israelites, God's people, goes to a foreign land and goes, man, I really like the way they're doing that. You know, I could really gain some more power with that. That really feels good to me. And so this is what he decided to do. King Ahaz sent Urijah, the priest, to, uh, he sent him the pattern of the altar and its model according to all its workmanship. 
So the pattern of the altar, it's the same word that's used in the, the likeness when God says, I'll create them in my likeness. According to this pattern and blueprint is what I want to be done. Now, in this case, he was saying, that's the way they do it, that's the way I want to do it. And it is completely false. But if we understand, uh, and I use it as an illustration to look at, what does it mean that we are created in the pattern or the image of God? Here's one thing that it means. Not only that do we, as human beings, recognize that we are fashioned by the hand of God. We have a creator. We didn't make ourselves. You know that? You didn't make yourself. You say, well, my parents did. You know, even that, your parents did not make you. God himself gave you life, and he gave that to your parents. And they stewarded you until a certain age. And, and it's through them that God brought your life, but it is not by them exclusively. God is the giver of life. So when we recognize we are created in the image of God, we first have to take a step back and go, we have a maker. And this is an important distinction for us today as followers of Jesus, believers in the one true God, that, that we need to recognize that human beings, the human race, is not a mistake. The human race is not a coincidence. The human race is not just the bringing together of different, uh, you know, molecules at a certain point in history and all of a sudden it happened. We have a maker. God made human beings. You say, well, I don't know why he made so many. I don't know why he made this guy. I don't know why he made... Listen, God made human beings. And we go further and we understand that not only do we have a maker, but that maker had a pattern and a purpose in making us. So when we see that we are made in the image and likeness of God, we understand that we were fashioned to a pattern in a specific form, a physical form, that bears some resemblance to our creator. And you say, that's a, that, that seems like yes, that's an understandable statement. But what is that resemblance and what does that mean? We were made in the form that we are right now. You look around this room, there's a lot of different kinds of people, but by and large, everybody in this room is the same. I mean, you go around the world, people look maybe different, they may talk different, they may eat different, they may be different heights, different widths, different everything, but pretty much, we're all very much the same. In a normative and healthy environment, we all have the same number of limbs and extremities and fingers. We all have the same organs on the same parts and the same sides of our bodies. We all are very, there's not a lot of variation when it comes to the human race, if you look at variation from a, a macro perspective. Every human being is pretty much the same. You go, well, but I mean, different cultures are way different. Have you been around the world at all? You recognize, how many of you love just en enjoying and appreciating different cultures around the world? Yeah, it's awesome. But you know, if you get a chance to travel around the world, you're gonna discover something pretty interesting. As you could go to the farthest deserts, uh, you could go to the farthest, the smallest villages, you could go everywhere, and you know what you're gonna find? You're gonna find all kinds of different food and language and stuff that you may not understand, but you're gonna see people who wanna live their life in peace, who wanna provide for their families, who wanna raise children, and who want to enjoy some form of hard work and experience and earning and, and, and something that brings a meaning to their life. You're gonna find that in every culture, in every country, in every place around the world. And you think, well, but every, people are so different everywhere. There's, people are so different everywhere that they're exactly the same. You go to the smallest village in the middle of Afghanistan, you know what you're gonna find? The same thing that you're gonna find in the smallest neighborhood in the middle of Kirkland. Yeah, it's a different zip code. Yeah, there's a lot of different th amenities and things in various places, but you know what? The same desires inside of you are the same desires inside of every human being around the world. We are created with a certain form and a purpose, and it's time for us to acknowledge that, that that is true of every single human being, and that there is more than just a shared experience, there is also a shared purpose and destiny that every human being has. I'll submit to you right now that we need to come to this place where unanimously, without exception, that we acknowledge that every human being bears a resemblance to their creator because they bear the image of God. Do you believe that? Think deeply about it. Think carefully for just a moment because how you live your life from this moment on will be informed by whether or not you believe that and how deeply you believe that. Do you believe that every human life from the moment of fertilization until the moment that it passes in a natural sense, it, that every human life is 
powerful, is beautiful, is precious, and is dignified because it bears a resemblance to its creator. Do you believe that's true about people that you hate? Some of like, well, I don't hate anybody. Well, you're a liar. He said, well, I mean, I try not to hate anybody. There you go. Now we're being a little more honest. I try not to hate people too. But sometimes my heart is just not good. I'm like, oh, and I would go, you know what, Lord? You forgave me when I was your enemy, so help me forgive those who are my enemies. Okay, God, why? Can I ask you this question? Why? Why would you forgive somebody who's a total jerk? Yeah, yeah, that's a good answer, Stephanie. She says, because she says, I am too. I, don't, I personally don't agree with your statement because I think you're a wonderful human being and I like you, but you know, we, we understand, yes, we should forgive others because... We can relate to them when they're jerks. Yeah, I've been a jerk too. But I can tell you, it goes much deeper than that. It's much deeper than just shared experience. Can I just tell you right now, the reason why we need to come to this place where we say, I deeply believe this, not just about the unborn, but about the jerks, about the, the horrible, just un, unmentionable. Why do, do those people bear a likeness to their creator? It's deep, 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 deep down in. But yes, they do. And that, my friends, is the very reason why we need to be champions of life in all of its expressions. Human life in every expression bears a resemblance to the creator. This is why we acknowledge the value of human beings. Because the image of God is in them, is in you. Can I just say, we need to apply this personally. Because sometimes people get to this place where they think everybody else is great, I'm just an idiot. Everybody else is great. I don't deserve it. And we start to get down on ourselves. Can I just tell you right now, in that moment, you may be acknowledging that there are some struggles in your soul, in your mind. There are some things that you're going through that don't feel good, that it's hard to see hope. But in that moment, you also need to know that the very image of God is in you. The likeness of God has been stamped upon you, and you bear his beautiful mark. And as terrible as you feel, you are still valuable and beautiful. So the same thing that we want to extend to our enemies, we need to be willing to embrace ourselves, and we need to be able to apply it universally to every human being. From the simplest of cells to the most complex of teenage problems. And everywhere in between. You say teenage problems. Man, I wish I had my teenage problems again. I got more complex problems than that. It's like, that's only because you forgot what it was like to be a teenager. And some of you are teenagers. You're like, yeah, he gets me. I'm like, you know what? I got a house full of, anyway, it's all good. Love it. You know, we see this, that we recognize, okay, so I want us to come to this place where we, we and we're going to shift gears here because this message is not just a message about uh, it's not just a humanitarian message that we need to be nice to everybody all around the world and, and embrace the value of everybody. If we can't get beyond that, we got big problems, especially as believers in Jesus. If we can't come to the place where we say every Muslim life is valuable, where we say every crazy, way out there, progressive, leftist, you know, socialist, communist, communist life is valuable, if we can't get to that place, then we shouldn't go any further in the gospel. Is that uncomfortable? It may not be what you're hearing on, on the news. It may not be what you're hearing in echo chambers around the world. It may not be what you're hearing, because everybody wants to divide and conquer, divide and conquer. Get rid of the morons and just surround yourself with people that you like, that agree with you. Listen, go ahead and do that. But I'm just saying right now, if, it res if your division and separation results in you distinguishing value from the lack of value in other human beings, you're not following Jesus. You're not believing the clear message of the scriptures that all human beings are created in the image of God. But this message must go further than simply recognizing the beauty and uniqueness in human beings. You say, why do we spend so much time there then? Because it is the beauty and the life of human beings that is under attack today in our culture. It's under attack. The image of God that God created the male and female, that's under attack. The image of God that God created, that God himself created, that's under attack. The image of God that is imprinted and is true in every simple cell, in every human, in, in utero and out, ex-utero, out-utero, whatever it is, 
You know, all of it. You say, okay, it's under attack today. The image of God in the, in the human family, husband and wife, raising children, that's under attack today. So we need to spend time speaking about and acknowledging the intention and plan of God before we really go any further. But I, are we in agreement here? Every human life is valuable. Even the ones you disagree with. Even the ones that you said it would be easier if they weren't there. Can I just tell you right now, let me just time this one out, because the, the, the conversation gets kind of complicated, especially around some of the things like, um, like life, like abortion. I know there's complicated questions that we ask. We say things like, well, I mean, what about cases of rape or incest? Say, so what is, should, should that, I mean, that, is that different? I mean, in those cases, and I'll just tell you right now, if your question is an anecdote, then, then you're, you're, we're wrong to begin with. Because human beings are not anecdotes. If it's, if it's an imaginary scenario, th then let's, let's talk, I wanna talk about real people. And you know what, let's talk about real people in the midst of complex decisions, and let's sit down with them, and let's help them walk through th understanding their own worth and value, and the worth and value of the life that is within them, and come around, how are we going to walk out in a way that brings dignity and worth and value to the situation, not just to the human life that's involved? You say, well, that sounds like you're saying uh, that rape and incest, you know, it's, it's, it's not different. Can I just tell you right now? The destruction of human life will never, ever, ever be a solution to any human problem. It's true, look. The destruction of a human life will not bring the answer, the answer to a situation where rape or incest is involved. And let me bring you something that's not just anecdote, but I'll just tell you, there are human beings, there are human beings whose life is the result of rape, whose life is the result of rape, that are personal friends of mine, that are beautiful, powerful, amazing people. And would we ever look in their eyes and say, you know what, this world would be better if you just were eliminated to begin with. We can't say that. We can't come to that place. You know, does that mean it's a simple solution? No, it doesn't mean, it, nothing is simple at that point. Nothing is simple other than this. The image of God and the life of God that he has imprinted upon us is something worth taking the time and sitting down with people and walking through. Let's not just come up with straw man arguments and anecdotes that help us justify certain policies and things. Let's talk about real people in real situations and understand that God himself is good and life is always what God is in support of. By the way, do a, do a search through history. There are people who are the product of things like incest and rape, which we acknowledge as sin, as terrible sin. But those, there are people who have changed history. Who that's their story. That's how they came to this planet. So you're saying, you know what, their life isn't valuable? You wouldn't say that, would you? We couldn't say that. We couldn't be honest about the word of God, about truth, about human existence, about the values that we hold, and about the promise of God through the gospel if we said something like that. So we acknowledge and recognize that although Although the, the conclusion is simple, the path to get there is anything but. Because we're human beings. And at the end of the day, we recognize that as beautiful and, and as amazing as the image of God in each one of us is, we all have a problem. Every single human being is sick with a problem. And that problem is sin. Sin. Now earlier in the service, we talked about this, the idea of addiction. We talked about the idea of idolatry. We talked about the idea of laying down our lives for Jesus. You know, we like to define sin in really easy to handle uh, ways. And, and most people's definition of sin goes like this. Bad stuff I do. Like if I were to ask you, hey, you know, what, are you, what sin are you struggling with? You'd, you'd, you know, there'd be a list of bad things that people do, right? Now certainly bad things people do, they qualify as sin. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not downplaying that, but I'm just telling you the biblical understanding and acknowledgement definition of sin is much broader, much more liberal than that. Can I give you a good biblical working definition of sin? I know you know this verse, but here's what it says in Romans chapter three, in verse 23. It says, uh, for all 
have sinned and do what? Fall short of the glory of God. Can I just tell you right now that God's definition of sin is not just, not just bad stuff that you do, but it is falling short of his glory. How many of you today have fallen short of God's glory? Okay, how many of you today desperately need the covering and righteousness of Jesus Christ in your life? Amen? And God gives it to us. God has afforded it to us freely and willingly, and all that he requires of us to accept it is faith in his son Jesus, that Jesus paid for what we never could, that Jesus overcame what we never could, that it is the righteousness of Jesus that we need, not our own fleshly striving for righteousness. Let me, let me land this plane with a concept and idea that might help us both acknowledge the, the beauty and the distinction of the image of God in every human life and empower us in the gospel. Because it is not simply God's plan that humans would, would live and experience physical life. It is God's plan for every human being that they would come to a place of eternal life through Jesus Christ. It is God's design that he stamped upon us in the very beginning that we would live with him eternally. And it is through Jesus Christ that we come to embrace the fullness of that image. Now Jesus was asked a question in Matthew chapter 22. It says uh, about, um, about the nature of what's, what is the word of God, the most important part of the word of God. And it says in Matthew chapter 22 verse 35, one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question. It's always the lawyers asking the questions. Would you just like to just turn the tables one time? Be like Jesus telling to one of the lawyers, where were you on the evening of, you know, just anyway. You know why that's, that's, that's the case? Because many of them just can't handle the truth. Okay, all right. Uh, verse 36, you asked him a question testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, he being Jesus, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Did you catch that there? Jesus basically just said, the entire scripture up until this point in, in history, the purpose of all of it is contained right here. God's design for human beings is summarized right there. God's purpose and plan that he breathed life into Adam is summarized in what Jesus just said. Love your creator with everything that is in you. Acknowledge that his, his image that is in you, you bear his likeness, and everything in you is for him. Everything in you is to obey him, to follow him, to worship him, to believe in him, and to walk with him. Love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the purpose that is in you. And then Jesus says, but it's not just a vacuum moment. It's not just in isolation that we accomplish this. You look around the world, and right now there's about eight billion neighbors that you have. You're living with all these people and all the creeping things that creep along the earth. I mean, there's all kinds of weird stuff going on. And, and he says, what about that? He says, you know, the second commandment is just like the first one. It is to love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, it is to acknowledge that we are the earth. That's the only commandment of, of God, by the way, that it seems like we've been pretty good at keeping is fill the earth. Multiply and fill the earth. There's lots of people. Good job, people. We're doing it. Uh, let's just work on the rest of it now. Let's work on loving our neighbor. But loving your neighbor is truly only possible when we acknowledge that it is the image of God in that neighbor. You know, it's easy to identify, and I'll just say this, that when we cease to recognize the image of God in ourself, that, we will, or in, that, God is in, that God has placed his stamp on us, we will begin to replace God in our worship and we will start worshiping things that we were never designed to worship. We'll start worshiping our family, our kids. These are good things, by the way. But when we stop seeing that it is the image of God in me that creates a, a desire to worship, we, God, that belongs to you, and we start putting it into our career, into our ambitions. We start putting it into our bodies, and we think that's what's to be worshiped. We have lost connection to the most important distinction of, hu of the human condition, that we are made in an image, in a likeness, with a purpose, with a plan, with a blueprint, with God's design. 
And when we stop seeing the very image and stamp and design of God in every other human being, whether we like them or not, when we cease to see the image of God in another, the invariable result is that we will sin against that other. So what do you mean here? It's easy to identify the big ones, by the way. Murder. How does murder take place? When somebody fails to see that there's a, a God image bearer right next to them, and they see them as just somebody who is in their way that needs to be removed. You, will, you cannot murder somebody that you believe holds the image of God. Abortion, it's the same, same argument, same case. Even if there's, it's, it's veiled or wrapped in compassion, we cannot come to a place to say compassion never is about eliminating a human life, it's about protecting a human life. The image of God is there, therefore we cannot do anything to extinguish that. Life and death is in his hands. Theft. Theft, would we agree theft is a sin? To take something that belongs to somebody else because you want it? Well, the only way that we can really accomplish that is if we begin to see a lesser value in somebody else and their possessions. So we're degrading the image of God in them. Because would you ever steal something from somebody that you're like, you know what, when I look at you I see Jesus, I'm just gonna take what belongs. Would you steal from Jesus? That's what I'm asking. If you would, we got bigger problems. Would you steal, would you knowingly and willingly rob from God Almighty, the Creator? Of course not. You love God. You love God. And so I think we, we need to come to this place where we see the image of God in others. We acknowledge it. We recognize it. It is what makes us closer to the design and purpose that God has for us when we love our neighbors, ourselves, and we love God. It's funny because this is essentially the problem with the world is that we have forgotten the image of God. We have forgotten whose image we bear, and we have forgotten that we bear, and so does our neighbor, that very image. Friends, it is a day on this Sanctity of Human Life Sunday that we call to memory. We call to memory what the Bible says on literally page one, all the way through the end, that it is God who is our creator, that it is we who bear his image, and that we have a responsibility to keep that in our relationship with him and to keep that in our relationship with others. And I'll close with this and invite our musicians to join me. Ephesians chapter two, verse 10 speaks of another creation. It speaks of another act of creation of God. Now we know clearly that God is the creator of all things, amen? I mean, in Revelation chapter four, this is the song that is sung in heaven, that God is worthy uh, of, to receive glory and honor and power for he created all things and because of his will, they existed and were created. God is the creator. The word created that's used a couple of times in that verse in Re Revelation 4 is the Greek word katidzo, katidzo. It's kind of fun to say, katidzo. Uh, but it, it, it means uh, to be brought about, to create, to form, to shape, or make, and it's always used of God. God alone is creator. But in Ephesians chapter 2, that same word is used with a voice to a different act of creation. Not simply God's breathing life into a form of dust. Not simply God creating mountains and seas and stars, but a new creation, which represents God's purpose, God's destiny for every human being. It says in Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Can I just tell you, this isn't speaking of the moment of your conception. This isn't speaking of the moment of Adam's creation. This is speaking of the moment of restoration when our faith is placed in God's one and only Son, Jesus Christ. It is in the gospel of Jesus and the repentance of our sins and faith in the Son of God that we find the full expression of the blueprint and design of God that we read about in the first page of the Bible. It is through Christ, not only that we are created in the beginning, but it is through faith in Christ we are recreated. We are recreated, and we find the very plan and purpose of God. And I will submit to you today that to be recreated by faith in, in Christ 
is God's purpose and design for every human being. And I just have a simple call to action and response today for all of us before we pray and we'll release you to connect with community groups and, and find a place to sign up this year. Because you know what? We want, we want to be in, in God's presence and be touched in God's presence, but we also want to be a value and be a shaped in, in God's people. And so that's what groups launch Sundays are all about. But here's my simple call to action and response today. Is that today, more than ever, as people who take God's word seriously and have Christ in our hearts, we need to be committed to the value of every single human life. That means the way that we pray, the way that we treat others, the way that we vote, the way that we influence policy, the way that we spend our money, the way that we work, everything that we do, we need to be laser focused on uh, fostering, creating, uh, helping, uh, supporting life in all of its expressions, especially where it is under attack, especially for the orphan, especially for the widow, for the single mother, especially for the unborn, especially for the elderly, for, especially for the immigrant, for those who are in vulnerable places, that we would say, we are here to speak to your dignity and value, and we're going to protect it as followers of Jesus Christ. You may not believe what we believe. You may not think what we think. You may not vote how we vote. You may not do anything like us, but we will fight for you and the, the beauty of God's image in you and the life that he has given you, that we should be more committed to life now than ever before. The battle lines are getting sharper and sharper, and we need to be more engaged in every place where this battle is being fought. Amen? Okay, so life of every human being. Secondly is this. It is not just life that we should be passionate about. As passionate as we are about protecting the unborn, as passionate as we are about bringing support and love to the single mother, to those who are raising children all, all by themselves, as passionate as we are about that, as much as we will resource and give towards that and pray for that, more than that, we need to be passionate about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if all we've done is help people live a few more years and we don't share the hope of eternity with them, we don't bring the purpose that God has for their life, then what is it for? And it's not, the beautiful thing is, I love this, it's not an either or. Oh, we are very pro-life. No, we are very evangelistic. We are, yes, we follow Jesus and he came to bring life and abundant life. He came to bring life in the womb, and he came to bring life in eternity. He came to bring life on the streets, and he came to bring life in heaven. He came to bring life to those who are in poverty, and he came to bring life forevermore. We are passionate about life. And I'm telling you right now, be, be passionate and be pro-life in every respect of the word, not just politically and not just on the hot button issues, and don't let that be defined and pigeonholed by the world. We're, we're in favor of life and be doubly passionate about the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's only plan of salvation, the only way that human beings will experience the original design and purpose, because the image of God is in us and in every one of our neighbors, amen? That's the sermon on Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And this might feel awkward that uh, then we release and go to connect in groups and different things, but we believe in the value of community if you uh, felt the Lord stirring your heart towards freedom from some form of life-controlling addiction, I want to encourage you to dial in and investigate our Monday night regeneration groups that is all about helping people walk in freedom. So if God started something, lean into it. Uh, if you're saying, man, I just really wish that there were people in my life that I could pray with, join any one of our small groups. Now if you, if there's, all, all of our leaders will be back here. That's why there's food, so you don't have to rush out the door, so you don't get all hangry and nasty at people. You can, you know, this is spiritual. This is what I'm saying. What happens at the altar, what happens in the foyer, what happens in the parking lot is spiritual, and we recognize it as such. So would you stand with me? And I just want to pray a prayer of blessing uh, over us, but before we do, I just want to pray a prayer of salvation, acknowledging the need of God. And if the Lord triggers something in your heart to just say, that's what I believe, then would you receive with faith the free gift of God of salvation today? So Father, we come to you right now in a moment of honesty and of transparency, acknowledging that we have fallen so far short of your glory. God, I have so far missed the mark of your glory in my own flesh and efforts, and I could never live up to it. 
Lord, I have done things that I ought not to have, but there are so many wonderful things that I could never accomplish because I'm a broken and sinful human being. And Lord, I recognize today that you stand in the position to absolve me, forgive me, and free me from this state of sin that I am in. And I know that it's not by my earning that right. It is because of your son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for my right of salvation and forgiveness. And so today I put my faith and trust that your son, Jesus, is my forgiveness. My sins which are confessed, I deliver to Jesus. I receive forgiveness through faith in Jesus. Lord, I believe not only that he died upon the cross, but I believe that on the third day, he was raised to life again, never to die, forevermore, raised eternally. I believe in his resurrection. I put my faith in that, and I believe that that same resurrection life lives in me, that even though I may die, I will never die because I believe in Jesus. So I receive this gift of salvation, forgiveness, and eternal life. Lord, I receive the fullness of your image lived out by being made and recreated in Christ Jesus today. We pray this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you believe with and agree with that prayer, would you simply say amen? Amen. amen. And now may the Lord bless you and protect you. And may the Lord smile down upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the Lord of life. Amen. Amen. Friends, if you want to pray, these altars are open, but I want to encourage you to stick around and get connected with some of our groups and leaders and ask other people if they're part of a group and if they'll open the door for you. We're so grateful that you joined us here today at Cedar Park Church. We know there's a lot of ways that you could be spending your time, but we're thankful that you are here with us. And we pray that it was a meaningful time that you were encouraged, that you heard from the Lord. That's right. And even though we're separated by time and space, we want you to know that it's important to us that you're with us today. And we're praying for you and believing in God's best for your life. And whether you're watching online because you're traveling or out of town, or maybe you're just checking out church, we would love the opportunity to say hello to you in person 